around the time I was, uh, I was sort of deep into doing commercials, um, I was still really into documentary and, and I guess I was still looking for a way of trying to find a, you know, a documentary subject or a, a way of making a film. And I ended up going to the Adelaide Documentary Conference. I don't know, it was probably like 2001 or something. Um, and it was a really inspiring time there. Um, had a great time and we drove there and back and I was in the car with some doco, fellow doco students. And on the way back, um, we were just telling stories about stuff we did when we were kids. And I told this sort of fairly loose story about, um, about when I was a kid and I was really into firecrackers. And I, you know, used to, you know, save my pocket money and buy firecrackers and save them up. And I, and, and when I finally went to, um, went to cracker night with my, my family, um, the first cracker I set off fell into the bag and then the, all the crackers went off. <laughs> and it was, it was still to this day the most, t the saddest thing that's ever happened. <laughs> um, uh, and someone in the car just wrote and said, oh, that'd make a great short film. And it was a bit, of, it, was, it was really strange. I'd never had an idea for a short film. I never thought about drama. I never thought about coming up with ideas for stories that weren't documentaries. And, but I, I kind of agreed. I thought, that's a really cool story. And, it, and it's my story. And so I don't, you know, I kind of can draw on my own experience from it. Um, and so I ended up going for funding for it. Like I thought, I'll go through the proper sources of funding and. Uh, and I got knocked back two years in a row. And I think I got to that point, I think I'd made enough commercials and we had some money with my producer and we just thought, let's just spend 20 grand and we'll make this film. Um, and so we went and made Cracker Bag, as it's called. And it was, it was sort of a, I mean, that was a whirlwind experience. I don't know if you know anything about the film, but we made it um, and it got into Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival in 2003, and it won the Palme d'Or for, for short film that year. Um, and I guess, uh, and so it was sort of, uh, I don't know, like a lot of doors opened really quickly after that. But I think to me, uh, it, as, a, as a filmmaker, it allowed me to start looking at things, like looking at drama as a possible way of being a director and being a filmmaker and not just being a doco maker. Even though, still in the back of my mind, I, st I really did think that doing drama was the dirty end of filmmaking. <laughs> The idea that you would go to someone and ask them to say something or, or, or that you would, I don't know, change, like dress something or like even though I was sort of doing it in commercials, I was still struggling with it. Um, but I, yeah, I just, I know, I just, I, I still, I mean, I still struggle with it. I, the, the nicest thing I think that was said about Cracker Bag though, even though it's a very stylized period drama, I don't know if anyone's seen it. They, they described it as a, a documentary after the fact. Yeah. And I kind of look at it now and I go, it, it, I mean, it's, it's not so much, I didn't intend it to that. It was never, never wrote it as a treatment, like, oh, it's going to feel like a documentary. It was more, it's just the way that I saw the world. It was just uh, from being a documentary maker, I didn't really know any other way of shooting something other than, like, this is where you'd put the camera because if we're a doco crew, this is where we put the camera or I'm not really going to, I'll do, I'll do everything I can to direct a scene or actors, even though like, they're all non-actors in the film, uh, and I'll just let, I'll just, I'll do everything I can before action, and then I just have to let them go. Um, and, I, and I guess it, it, was, it sort of established a, a, a directing style for me, uh, even though I've done a lot, you know, uh, Sorry, yeah, Charlie, yeah. Did you know them Were they people you knew? No, no, no. I mean, the Cracker Bag, I mean, I don't talk too much about Cracker Bag, but it is so specifically my life, like down to the most ridiculous amount of detail that when I made, even when I was making that film, I just thought, I can't, this is so cool, I'm making a film, I can't wait to show my mum at Christmas, because she'll <laughs> like it. Like, I just thought, oh, this is, like, she'll get it, because it's, you know, it's, it's the car. You know, so. Yeah, like everything, the only thing that's not my life in that film is that I'm not a girl. <laughs> and, and, well, we, I, I looked at tons of kids, like 
tons of boys and even like I mean I was going up to parents <laughs> in shopping centers and <laughs> always sounds really <laughs> Uh, trying to find, like, just saying, oh, maybe that's the kid. That kid looks, you know, you know, like all those dumb things that you do. Um, and then I was working with a, a casting director, Fiona Dan, and she, this is well, like a few weeks out of filming, and she said, look, I just saw this amazing young girl, like, at a, at a drama school. Like, would you consider a girl? And I was like, yeah, let's get her in. To anything, I'll just, do, I, don't, I don't mind, let's just have a look. And the moment she walked in, it was like, that's her. Like, that's, and I think I was looking, because it was so, you know, specifically based on my experiences, I was looking for me. I was looking for the kid, that, which you're never going to find. But I saw this kid, and, and pretty much the way that she's dressed in the film is how she walked in. And I just went, you know, this is maybe, maybe this is, I don't know, like, I won't change anything, but we'll just have a, a, a young girl in the role. And I, and I, like, regardless of the story and the tone and all that sort of thing, I, I, I do think it's the success of the film was about that casting decision. Because it went from being a boy's own adventure to a thing about childhood. Um, and I, didn't, I don't think we changed anything. In fact, no, that's when I changed the stones. Um, even though we did that as kids. I think that originally um, the, the, the main character was mowing the lawn for loose change. And I just thought, in that family, uh, like she wouldn't mow the lawn, the big brother would. So I just had to find, an, which you know, ended up being a better device anyway. But we didn't change anything else, and I don't ever. I think I just went through and changed he to she. That was it. And didn't, didn't change. Didn't make it gender specific in any other way than that. Didn't change her actions. Um, but I, I guess the other thing I learned from that was that I was saying it was so specific to the point where I thought only my mum and my brother would like it. The carpet that we chose, like it's so. It was. It was really trying to recreate something from when I was ten years old. Um, but I found that the more specific that you make something and the, and the world that you take something in and the more specific it becomes, the more universal it becomes automatically. And I, you know, you think about the films that you really love, like that, that the films that you just love to death, and they're going to be in places that you're not directly related to, that are, and they're generally they're super specific. And it's interesting when you pitch something to, something, to someone and say, like, so, oh, like, you know, it's... You know, you, there's this sense that you've got to try and make it universal, so it's for broad appeal. I'd argue that the more specific you make something, the more universal it becomes. Like Sherpa. <laughs> like, there's a film that doesn't involve any of us, and yet, it, like, we're not part of that world, we're not part of that community. It's far away, I don't think any of us has ever been there, I'll, I'll probably never go there. But, it, but there's something very specific, it speaks to us. Not only because we're all sticky beaks and we just want to we just want to see where we're not meant to see, or where we can't see. But I think there's something ultimately very human about exposing those details to other people. Um, um, but I, I, want to, I want, just want to quickly show a clip of, of some other films. Um, when I was at film school, and this, is, this still fascinates me to, to, to today, and I guess this is the doco drama crossover, um, there was, I, had a, I had an amazing lecturer who was... Uh, his name was Peter Tammer, um, and he, he was sort of a, I mean, he was a doco guy. I almost saw him like a guru, like he was so important to me. And he, he really challenged us on many levels. Like I was like, documentaries, we're doing it because they're the truth. They're about truth, truth. And you don't, you know, like that's why you don't ask someone to say something. Like they, they have to say it, and I have to be there when they say it, et cetera, et cetera. But he was always interested, I guess, in the blurriness between when doco becomes narrative or fact and fiction, sort of that blurry line. And, and I guess that's why, you know, like Cracker Bag, I, I gave myself permission to be able to do that because it's sort of, it's the truth, but we manufactured the whole, the, the whole world around that. And everything I've done since, I've tried to find uh, what the actual truth is, either it's based on real events or, or a book, you know, like I've done adaptations of books that I end up treating as the truth, like that's real life and this thing actually happened and then I do an interpretation of it. Um, but it, I've always been fascinated, I guess, by when, when those lines blur. And, and, and I, I, I think it's sort of, for me, the moments of, in cinema, when, the, when it gets really blurry, 
that's when I find myself leaning in and going, I don't know how you even conjure up this stuff. Like it's so, so different.